for joining this morning. My name is April Wood with the American Red Cross National Headquarters, and uh, I'll be uh, your presenter this morning as we have a, a dialogue around multi-agency data sharing and sharing some of the tools we've had the opportunity at the Red Cross to, uh, to build with our partners over the last year. And I want to give uh, my colleague an opportunity to do introductions as well. So go ahead, Kimberly. Hi, good morning. My name is Kimberly Stout. I'm the Government Operations Manager with the Red Cross, uh, working specifically uh, relationship management with our federal partners, and I am here to support April this morning uh, moderating your questions. Thanks, Kimberly. And uh, Sarah, do you want to do a quick intro of yourself? Yes, thank you. So I work on the Foundations Communications team. And um, we're so excited to be kicking off our ninth annual Building Resilience Conference um, with April Wood as our first breakout session leader. So without further ado, um, April, will take it away. Great, thank you. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and then I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of um, background and some history uh, on where we have come from. Um, before I share, I would like to offer just a couple of tidbits of information. The first of all is that I'm not a technical expert. Uh, so you guys go easy on me with the tech questions. I'm an emergency room nurse by background and have worked with our uh, national um, disaster response and recovery partners for about a decade now um, in the emergency management space. So I appreciate everybody's time this morning joining and being patient with us as we do our first uh, virtual conference demo of the work that's been completed. And uh, we will go ahead and dive right in. I'm gonna take uh, three different parts. I'm gonna start with talking about um, some of the work we've done at the American Red Cross um, using our enterprise portal system. And then I will jump over and we will talk about the Disaster Partner Hub. So minimize you guys here. Are you able to see my screen, Sarah? Okay. Hopefully you guys can see my screen here. Um, so one of the first things that I wanted to start with today is uh, a lot of the tools, um, you know, COVID-19 has really challenged the way all of us are responding and operating. And you're not gonna be able to see this slide very good. They're not all like this, I promise. Um, but I did wanna start with just showing some of the resources that at the Red Cross that we're using in our enterprise portal system, RCVU. So we embarked upon um, building our, our portal about four or five years ago with the Esri team. Uh, this has been a transformational platform for us at the Red Cross while we had been long time users of ArcGIS Online, this was really the next step for us to be able to provide a common platform uh, for operational use and incident management across all of our Red Cross um, divisions and regions around the country, as well as to be able to share information with our partners. So knowing the history of where we've come from with RCV as our internal facing system, and then where we were headed with the creation of the Disaster Partner Hub over the last year, is important to understand that all of it was on a, a long-term roadmap to be able to share as much data as possible with our partner organizations. Um, so this example internally for us is looking at how we're taking um, our hazard propensity and risk scores, disaster risk scores across all of our Red Cross regions, um, where we have about seven years worth of data um, that we pull in and have been um, using to see what our highest probability event this time of the year is, which is a hurricane, of course, as we move into hurricane season. Um, looking at um, the three lines that you see on this map, are actually um, COVID-19 projections. And so this, uh, the high line is the, the high count for fatalities, daily fatalities, um, the medium line, and then the lower deaths as well. And you can look at it by day to be able to see what's going on across the country in the context of disaster risk and response on behalf of the Red Cross region. So this is an important tool that we have been using to be able to see um, you know, what's taking place on any given day, what the projections are, and we update this weekly as part of our tools, in addition to using many other tools, um, as all of you are across the country um, for COVID. But I thought this was a nice example to share of how we're taking all of the disaster risk data and hazard propensity scores we've created um, using historical data and then overlaying that with the projections of COVID um, as we continue to monitor when we need to respond um, to a high impact event in a particular area. Some other examples of how we're using our internal system um, that we're looking to share some of these products in the future with our partners. This is from the, um, the Puerto Rico earthquake that occurred back in January. And using some of these tools known as a story map tool where you can build and create information products, um, we were able to do and conduct some community assessments um, at a barrios level where we were able to go in and see. So I'm just gonna click on one here um, in this particular part where we have um, a population count of 29. So just a quick community assessment that was taking place. 
where there were 29 people in a particular area, and I'm gonna keep scrolling here, that um, they observed some chronic health conditions. Um, they had identified these, um, these family of individuals behind a store where people were sleeping in a tent and cars. There was a baby, there was a, a couple of dogs, there were some children that were there, elementary school age children, um, and some aging folks as well, and really recognizing the help that they needed at that point in time as these community assessments were conducted. So using these tools, we were able to quickly identify that this community um, needed some serious um, assistance and a great deal of assistance with our coding of, of yellow, green, and red, and be able to direct resources and assistance um, to this particular family. Um, for me, I'm a visual person, so images, um, images say a lot. So having the opportunity to be able to have an image available and associated with a particular narrative or story or survey that was conducted within a particular community is always helpful to really help inform um, situational awareness and decision making when you're looking to adjudicate some resources. I'm going to jump over here now to another story map. Um, and these story maps are one of the primary um, capabilities that we've been using in ArcGIS Online and in Enterprise Portal to be able to share information with our partner organizations. Um, this is all about collaboration um, through the public-private partnerships and so many organizations on the corporate side have supported the development of these tools for us that it's really important for us at the American Red Cross to be able to give back and share these tools um, whenever possible with our partners. So about two years ago we started developing these individual partner briefs where we were able to, when a large scale event occurred, capture situational awareness information and be able to get that out to our partners. So we have a number of pieces of data, but in particular for this discussion today, I wanted to share um, some of the damage assessment information to demonstrate the collaboration um, occurring before the hub existed even as, as part of the history as we move towards the development of the hub. Um, so as for Hurricane Florence made landfall, this is the detailed damage assessment that the American Red Cross conducted. You'll see the red, orange, yellow, and green circles on the map. Um, red is destroyed, orange is major, yellow is minor damage, and green are affected dwellings. And so having the opportunity to visualize this on a map in near real time as these detailed damage assessments were being conducted is an important piece of information that we needed to be able to share back with our partners from a collaboration perspective. It helps inform other types of service delivery. It often expedites financial assistance that other organizations utilize the, the detailed damage assessment information to be able to make decisions and provide um, some tools to, to people that have been affected in the community. But what was really important for me for this particular event was that it was the first time that we were able to partner with Crisis Cleanup and the Crisis Cleanup Call Center. And so the purple stars you see on the map are actually an overlay of um, information that has come into the Crisis Cleanup Call Center. So for instance here, um, you can see that a call came in to Cumberland County um, with a request for trees, removal of trees in a primary in-home residence, and that this status of this case was completed. Uh, so the history once again here is this is the first time we had the opportunity to overlay different types of data. For Hurricane Florence, we were using a static, um, just a static overlay with a goal of automation for the future. And so it was able to help see where there were gaps in the community, where there was potentially damage reported through the call center or work order requests coming into crisis cleanup, where maybe our damage assessment teams had not been yet, um, and vice versa, where you could see pockets of detailed damage assessment that had been conducted, um, but maybe there were, were other gaps or concentrated areas of damage. And so having the visibility and the visualization to use these tools um, was incredibly helpful for some of that decision making. We also included things like the CDC Social Vulnerability Index to look at all demographic information and then of course the FEMA Individual Assistance um, aggregated applications as well. So I'm going to take a pause there and pivot over to the hub. Um, so Kimberly, any initial questions on the front end before we dive into the hub which is the bulk of our discussion? Uh, no questions at this point. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, here we go. And thank you guys for your patience as we do this virtually today. Um, I will be happy to answer as many questions as I can. I may not have all the answers, but I really wanted you guys to have some of the background um, because 
you know, as part of my time in the disaster sector over the years, um, you know, I've, I've had the privilege to serve on the National Bud Board of Directors for six years. And so many of the conversations that we had over the last decade, I feel like are really culminating in the ability to embrace these new technology tools that we have and the partnerships, the public and private partnerships that we've been able to build. Um, in particular for the hub, the, uh, the support from Walmart has been phenomenal. We could not have done this without them. And I know Kadira Harris is moderating another um, concurrent session right now, but um, truly the Walmart team has, has made this possible through their generous support, um, as well as many, many, many other organizations that have worked with us over the last year. And so before I dive into the demo itself, I just want to take a few minutes and talk about some of the process that we utilized over the last year. Um, so one of the things that was really important to us was that we didn't go out and develop a system that we at the Red Cross decided um, would be helpful or necessary or the types of products and information tools. So we embarked on engaging approximately 20 organizations um, across the topic areas of feeding operations, shelter operations, call center data, as well as damage assessment information. And we worked with these organizations to hold a series of data discovery conversations, requirements gathering, um, to really inform the development of some multi-agency applications um, that we have developed here in the hub um, over the last year. I will offer the hub is not live yet. It's coming very soon um, in the next month or so. It will be out and available for use. We are going to do a phased implementation um, as we engage a number of organizations. The hub is closed, it's a closed hub, so it is by invitation only at this point. Um, the reason behind that is that we felt like that um, we wanted to create a space, a collaboration and information sharing platform for our operational partners. And our operational partners may include our government partners at all levels, our national nonprofit volunteer organizations we work with and, and NGOs, as well as some corporate operational partners that um, are very interested in, in two-way data sharing and having the opportunity to really inform data-driven decision making. The entire premise and purpose behind the hub was making sure that we have the opportunity to increase the situational awareness for everybody responding to disasters in a way that we're promoting a transparent and open two-way data sharing platform um, with a trusted group of operational partners. And uh, I'm sure the vision for the future one day is that we were able to share some of these products with the general public. Um, but for now, this is this is really about change management and leadership commitments and you know the, the fear and the risk and all the other things that come along um, with opening up and sharing data in a way as a sector that we simply have not done so before. Uh, so it's really important to us that we are, we're taking baby steps and we're making sure that we um, are putting everybody at ease and, and taking the steps necessary as um, we worked very hard to develop our terms of use, our acceptable use policy for the hub. And uh, I'm gonna dive in at this point and show you guys some of the tools we've developed. So this is uh, the homepage for the Partner Hub. Um, you'll see a number of photos and images here in the Hub. We are still seeking some multi-agency images um, as we continue to make sure that this does represent the multi-agency sector. So we have a number of pages I'll come back to here around ongoing disaster response and planning and resources. The four areas that I mentioned below are the pages specific to those topic areas of feeding and sheltering operations, call center and damage assessment information. We also have the partner situational awareness briefs, which I mentioned earlier. I showed you the Hurricane Florence brief as one example of creating those. We do have a COVID-19 partner brief that is available, um, and we have uh, garnered more than 10,000 views of that just in the first couple months of it being out and available to our partners to be able to access. Um, it's important to note that many of the organizations that we partner and work alongside every day at the Red Cross do not have access to these types of tools or RGIS online accounts to be able to, um, to use technology in a way um, that's helping them make their own decisions or have access to information at their fingertips. Uh, and I mentioned that I was not a technical expert, um, so I, I would offer if I can do this, anybody can do this. Um, it's been a great learning curve over the last year and a half, but it's been so exciting to see how we can leverage these tools in a way that really lifts us all as a disaster sector along the way. On the homepage, we also have the opportunity to embed a featured story. Um, we had built a story here about learning about the feeding mission and having the opportunity to work with our feeding partners um, that we, we work alongside every day to be able to create um, a story that also helps educate um, while at the same time includes the mapping component. So 
If I give some examples here, this is um, a multi-agency approach to feeding. We talk about the feeding vehicles, um, the canteens at the Salvation Army, the Red Cross Irvs. We highlight a particular crew of volunteers that drove an IRV from Alabama to uh, North Carolina for the Hurricane Florence response once again. And then having the opportunity to see how the Baptists bring their kitchens from Alabama and set up and how their volunteers are working and serving the community. This was a husband and wife volunteer team from the Southern Baptist Disaster Relief Crew um, who had come in to be able to help cook. And so we've embedded a video here of them talking about their experience. So I'm not going to go through this entire story map, but it gives you an example of some of the ways to tie back in the, the visualization of the work, telling the story that's going on and being able to tie the mapping components to that as well. The hub includes a find data function. And so, um, for instance, I'm going to type in the Salvation Army here. This is a live demo. So what could possibly go wrong, right? So if you're looking for Salvation Army information, um, we would be able to click and see some of the Salvation Army um, data points that have been included here. So they're using a mapping platform called Genesis as this loads. So this has their global assets mapped across the country where they have a presence in local communities. So having the ability to be able to see and access information like this um, is also a game changer in most cases for, for many organizations. I'm gonna take us back to the homepage here. I scroll back down. And then we have a number of self-paced training that's available here. I'm not gonna go into the training today, but um, there are at least a half dozen pages or more that are available um, that really walk you through all of the details around if you wanted to learn how to share data in the hub, having the opportunity to do so. And then of course, many of our thank yous to our contributing data partners who have already shared um, data as we continue to build out the level of information um, that is being shared by our partners. We are continuing to work with dozens of organizations um, to be able to promote information sharing. And when I say information sharing, I wanna talk about that just a little bit. So we have the opportunity to automate as much data sharing as possible, which is the, really the end goal. I had mentioned the crisis cleanup back during Hurricane Florence two years ago, where when we shared data for the first time, it was simply a static upload of data to add that layer to the map. Um, we have now built an API with crisis cleanup and we're in the finishing touches to be able to plug that in and do two-way data sharing where we're sharing our data with crisis cleanup and they're sharing their data with us in an automated fashion um, so that we avoid the static, uh, the static uploads and the static manual processes that occur. We know how we all are very busy during a disaster response and the goal in, is really to automate data whenever possible. Some of the barriers to that have been the technology platforms and the lack of access to um, databases, data strategies, and uh, just really having the, the technical infrastructure available um, in a lot of cases. And so that has been part of the struggle of some of the conversations we've had. Um, but here I wanna show you the ongoing disaster response page. So this is really our incident tracker. This is the incident reporting um, application that forms the backbone um, for the hub. So here you will see, um, right now you're only seeing Red Cross data because we have not um, gone live with the hub yet. But this would be the place where partners would have the opportunity if they were responding to a particular incident that they could capture their response um, and indicate that they're responding. Only one time does it need to be entered. It does not need to be entered by every organization every time, um, but it will essentially create an incident. So in the top left over here, you see the COVID response. We did a, conducted a pilot for the COVID-19 feeding operations. And so all of the data that's currently in the hub, um, you will see that the live data is really specific um, to the COVID-19 pilot that we recently conducted. Um, but this is where those multi-agency disaster responses would show up. And then we have the opportunity to have a layer here to be able to share with our partners of Red Cross data. So anytime that our fusion desk issues a disaster relief operation or an incident, so these are initial incident reports that come in overnight. Um, let's take a look at this one here. This is in Utah. It's um, the type of incident is a wildland fire in Washington County, and it's a growing trend. So there are different triggers in place to be able to report different things. And this shows that the Red Cross chapter is expecting to be able to provide shelter, food, and casework if needed um, to the families affected by that fire um, during that evacuation process. So this is an important piece of being able to know what's happening where and understand who's responding, um, which we'll also talk a little bit about here in a moment. 
We also conducted a second pilot in Puerto Rico during the earthquake. And so with that pilot, it was the first time that we had engaged some of our feeding partners around trying to understand where everybody was feeding. And so some of the lessons learned from that um, was that the automation is key, particularly when you have a large number. So here you'll see that this application is meant to um, to cover all types of service delivery. So you would enter the number of service delivery locations, the name, and then the type of services at that location. So everything is done by type of services. We chose to limit this application only to feeding for the purposes of the pilot. And we were able to identify the 48 fixed locations as well as the five mobile locations um, for the Puerto Rico earthquake response. And you can see our partners at World Central Kitchen, Salvation Army, the Baptists with their kitchen sites, and then of course the Food Bank um, as well through the Feeding America Network were all um, participating organizations during the initial pilot that we conducted. We were also able to see where multiple agencies were providing services at a particular location. So the big stadium, for instance, where there were a lot of ongoing feeding operations, there were a number of these organizations that were all providing feeding at the same location. And it was the first time that we had seen this data together on a particular um, map. This is our monitoring center. And so we have all of the weather information that you would need to make decisions about precipitation, flood, wind, any severe ongoing warnings. Um, you can see that currently, I just refreshed about 15 minutes ago, um, we have five flash flood warnings across the country and one special marine warning. This is also the place on the left, you see tab number two, where it says FEMA National Shelter System Open Shelters. This would also be a place where you could take a look at that and understand if there were any open congregate shelters around the country that were, um, were taking place. Uh, we are in this COVID environment, um, working very hard with our partners to focus on non-congregate sheltering. So essentially, other alternative forms of putting a lot of people in the same place at the same time. Um, in particular, a lot of hoteling is ongoing, um, but we also recognize that if we were to have a large scale hurricane response um, with the, you know, hundreds of thousands of people evacuated, that that would not be a viable solution. So we've been working hard to make sure that we have um, sheltering accommodations that are as safe as possible during this COVID environment. And then we still have our briefs again that you can reference. Kimberly, any questions so far? Uh, yes, we have a couple questions for you. Um, one is, have we developed a way for new and interested partners to get involved in the hub, specifically government partners? Yeah, so as part of the phased implementation that we're looking to do over the next six months as we roll out, um, we certainly are, are highly interested in making sure that we have our, um, our federal partners as well as our state emergency management partners highly engaged and sharing information as we move into hurricane and wildfire season. Um, we know that there's above average predictions for that, um, so we are attentive to that. As part of the requirements gathering and the early engagement for those 20 or so core organizations that I mentioned, we did engage um, a large uh, city uh, as well as a government county level um, type organization. And so both of those were engaged as part of the initial um, development as representing different levels and layers. Um, and of course we work alongside FEMA um, with data sharing all the time. This just gives us a new avenue to be able to share data amongst our organizations and really continue to enhance our level of collaboration Collaboration. So we are highly interested in making sure that we were able to um, have our government partners have access to the hub in the future, and that we're also able to provide as many feeds into their systems as possible, because it's not always about everybody coming to the partner hub. It's also about making sure that the right data is available to the right people to make decisions from. And whenever possible, where we can automate that data sharing, um, we want to make sure that we're supporting that. Uh, another question is, um, when will we put out solicitation opportunities for disaster preparedness requirements such as bottled water or PPE products? Is that something we will do? So I might need a little bit more context around that question. So solicitation of products, um, I just would like some clarity on whether you're talking about more in-kind donations or donations management of identifying a particular resource need um, that might be needed in a particular location. Um, I will offer that if that is the intent behind the question, um, right now for the purpose of, of the development to date, um, we have looked at tracking um, 
resources from a donations management perspective and in-kind is out of scope for this project. Um, it is still open for discussion in the future, um, but we really felt like focusing on some, some tangible areas that were less complex and would get us started in the beginning, knowing that there are a number of other areas that we would love to expand on in the future. Um, I'd also refer folks back to the National VOAD Donations Management Platform. Um, one of our also key decisions was not to, um, to avoid any duplication of efforts ongoing. We work closely with the National VOAD team and, and Greg Forster and want to make sure that, um, that you know, folks understand what resources are available um, for use. So happy to answer any follow up on that if there's some additional context. Uh, a follow up to the first question actually is, will private sector partners be able to engage with this platform? So that is our intent at the moment. I will tell you that the policies and the processes are still um, in development at this point, um, but it is our intent to provide some access to our operational partners um, within the private sector. We know that we all work together and coordinate together and providing opportunities to be able to share data. Um, the, the details are still forthcoming around that, um, but yes, there is an intent to provide access um, to a number of our private sector partners. Uh, and lastly, um, does the American Red Cross partner program work with FEMA whole community program for public safety, emergency response, and public health organizations? A bit of a broad question. Kimberly, or do you want to take that one? Uh, I will leave that with you as pertains to the hub. Okay. So, um, so as far as data sharing for the hub goes, um, we work closely with the uh, mass care team, as well as the volunteer agency liaison team. Um, we've been working with the recovery analytics team as well. Um, so as you well know, FEMA has lots of different departments and branches and sections. And so we do um, highly engage them, um, but we have more work to do and more additional data as discussions we'd like to have in the future. Um, for the focus of what has been developed to date, um, we really focused on the feeding shelter call center and damage assessment information, knowing that there are lots of other topic areas and lots of other applications we could develop and lots of other departments we can engage. Um, but to date, that is who we have predominantly worked with at FEMA, specific to the development of the hub application. Uh, thank you, that is it for now. Okay, great. Um, so one of the other things we wanted to do was capture as many planning and resource information before a disaster happens to be able to um, understand who is where within a particular community. So as this map loads, we'll see a number of examples here. And see what I said, nothing could possibly go wrong here. Let me move this out of the way. All right. I'm going to skip this one and we're going to go to the next tab. I may come back to that in a minute. I think there's a sign on issue there. So that was my fault. I had not pre-launched that one ahead of time. Um, so I talked about the four different areas. Uh, so what you would have seen on that map a moment ago was a map that showed different locations of different organizations. So the Feeding America Food Bank was on the map. Um, you would see the Walmart stores, the live feed from Walmart of their open and closed stores, as well as um, in, in AACP locations um, for some of the other partners we work alongside in communities. There were some faith-based examples of uh, the Pentecostal Church, for example, and all of their locations of their faith Based groups across the country. So just a rich content layers um, that we continue to add to of a number of organizations who share their data into the hub and are also able to export data out of the hub. So it is two-way data sharing that is enabled. On the call center front, um, we have worked with a number of organizations over the last year um, to develop this multi-agency call center dashboard. And so as this loads, you will continue to see um, Red Cross data that is pulled in here. As I mentioned, we have completed the development of the a API um, with crisis cleanup. And so we know that that's gonna be coming into the hub here very soon. I'm gonna go back to this year because this quarter started in July 1st and let it load. Um, but having the ability to be able to overlay the crisis cleanup call center data with the Red Cross 86,000 plus calls that have come in um, this year since January 1st, with being able to filter them by the type of incident coming in and having the ability to overlay other pieces of information. So we've been working with many partners. Um, one of those is our General Motors at OnStar division. Um, we've been having some a lot of dialogue and discussion with them in hopes of being able to hopefully overlay some of their um, data, aggregated anonymized data. I should emphasize that there's no personally identifiable information um, in the hub. 
So all of the data that you see to inform decision making is focused on aggregate data and anonymized data, um, making sure that we're protecting the privacy of not only the people that we're serving, but also the volunteers um, that are collecting the information and sharing that. Uh, so this particular vision behind this was being able to understand where the calls are coming from and what the calls are coming in for. So you'll see on the dashboard on the left that um, out of those 86,000 plus calls we've received since the beginning of the year, that 57% of them have been requests for food, 48% included requests for water, and 71% almost for, for financial assistance, which I think really speaks to the, um, the struggles that a lot of folks are having across the country at the moment. We also had received um, requests for short-term and long-term sheltering. And uh, you also see the same around the financial assistance and the short-term sheltering of high percentage of calls for those two particular needs as folks um, struggle with a lot of the high unemployment that's taken place due to COVID and a number of other compounded um, social issues that are taking place. So. We're excited in the future to have additional data layered in here from our partners. Um, we've also been in dialogue with our partners at 211, um, knowing that they're still building out their national platform that we're in hopes of connecting with them once that's complete. And then having some dialogue with some local affiliates of 211s um, to be able to look at piloting um, some API data exchanges um, with them as well. So any questions on call center before I move on to the next topic? None at the moment. Okay, I'm gonna move on to feeding then. Uh, so feeding is probably one of the areas I'm most excited about. Um, once again, having had the opportunity to work alongside our feeding organizations, um, our partners at the Salvation Army, the Southern Baptist, Feeding America, USDA, World Central Kitchen, um, having the ability to work with these organizations and other organizations like Operation Barbecue over the last um, several years, we really recognized um, that we wanted a place to be able to capture information and share information. So we built four different applications um, for feeding. And so the first one is being able to report and identify a feeding resource. And so I'm actually gonna click here so we can see it in a different screen where you can see the survey itself and have a chance to take a look at it. So this is one of the key foundational pieces um, to be able to visualize the data. We have streamlined this and to make it as minimal as possible. Um, this is the example of doing manual data entry. So in conversation with our partners, there are times when they may only have a couple of sites that are open and really felt like that manual data entry might be the right way to go with sharing information, while at the same time understanding that there are other times, particularly during COVID, where you may have more than a thousand locations across the country, and the importance of being able to automate that data, which I'll talk about here in a moment. So we've preloaded in many of the organizations we've worked with that I just mentioned. Um, we did expand based off of the COVID pilot. Some of the things that we learned um, were that we wanted to add two different feeding resource types. Um, so we were able to add food pantries and soup kitchens to better capture the ongoing feeding operations within a community um, that we know are associated um, often with a food bank or faith-based organizations. So having the opportunity to track those additional two feeding resources was an important lesson learned from our COVID feeding pilot. This is a dynamic survey. So whenever you're looking at being able to put in um, your location type, um, it's important to know that the survey questions change based off of those types. So if you choose mobile kitchen, um, it'll ask you different questions than if you were to select mobile distribution or fixed kitchen um, as a particular example. So going back to the actual feeding page itself, once the survey is data has been entered, um, the second application allows you to change and edit the data. So this allows you to be able to sort by disaster name. It's still loading, so we'll give it a second here. Organization name and by county to understand what's going on across the country. Um, so if you wanted to be able to edit your data um, in a way that was going to allow you to change the operating status of your kitchen, for instance, um, to be able to see that the a kitchen had moved from operational to closed potentially, um, you would be able to do that through this application itself. And I'm gonna scoot on over to the dashboard that's hidden up under the toolbar here. Okay. So here is the partner feeding summary dashboard. So both of those prior applications feed this dashboard. This is um, one of my favorite um, applications within the hub because it 
provides the real-time um, information and situational awareness on ongoing feeding operations for the participating partners that we're engaging, which are the bulk of the large-scale feeding partners across the country. The data that you see here um, was specifically from the COVID-19 feeding pilot. It was conducted over the course of about mid-April to mid-June. And so the only active data now is World Central Kitchen. We were able to automate um, their data that's pulling in. So you can see here, they still have more than 1,700 points of distribution active across the country right now in support of COVID. Um, a number of our other partners also um, had included their information. The Baptist had six kitchens that were operating um, to provide COVID feeding and Operation Barbecue had a couple of kitchens as well. We also conducted our first pilot with a VOAD, a Voluntary Organization Active in Disaster. So the state of New Jersey, led by under Keith Adams' leadership and a team of volunteers, um, worked very hard to be able to um, pull in all of their data around feeding resources within the state of New Jersey. And being able to capture and vet that data and information and shared about 4,000 rows of data um, specific to New Jersey. So we're well positioned if something happens in New Jersey in the future um, to be able to engage around what feeding resources resources and types of resources exist there um, by organization and by type. You'll notice there's another tab on the bottom down here called daily feeding activity. So this gives us the opportunity to be able to toggle. Um, you'll see the filters on the left to be able to sort by organization name once again, to be able to sort by um, a date range for daily reporting. And you can see here just the trends from the World Central Kitchen automated data that um, you can, you know, just at a quick visualization, you can see that feeding gets lighter on Saturdays and then gets significantly lighter on Sundays and then picks back up during that Monday through Friday work week. Um, so having, once again, the opportunity to see multiple organizations here in the future overlaid with who's preparing meals where um, and how many meals are being served every day, how many food boxes are being distributed by our partners. We continue to work on the processes and procedures with these organizations in partnership and collaboration for everybody to be able to better understand who has active feeding operations where. Um, so any questions on this? Not at the moment, April. Okay. Let's see if I can get to my next tab here. All right, so damage assessment. Um, so having the opportunity um, Actually, before I go to damage assessment, I'm going to go back and show you guys one more thing if I can get it to load here. So part of this is putting it all together, right, and being able to understand what's happening where um, in a way that you can look at all the layers, you can analyze all the data, and you can make decisions from it. So understanding that, um, we did build two web applications within the hub, one for feeding operations and one for damage assessment operations to be able to compare damage assessment information. And so I will come back um, to the damage assessment here in a moment, but if we can get this to load for the, the web application, uh, I wanna make sure that we have the opportunity to see how those can be used in real time. It looks like the lovely uh, loading is taking longer than what I had hoped um, this morning would occur. So we may or may not get to see this one. All right, well, let's move back onto the damage assessment and we'll get that one to pull up for us. So here for DA, working once again with a number of other organizations to include some local county and city government jurisdictions, as well as our nonprofit partners, um, we wanted to build a, some tools to be able to provide collective damage assessment information. Uh, so we built two different surveys around damage assessment. One was focused on um, detailed damage assessment, and one was focused on preliminary community assessment. Um, so it is mobile friendly. You can download the QR code and have those surveys on your, um, your mobile device. The preliminary community assessment is similar to PDA, preliminary disaster assessment, but we really wanted to call it community assessment because it was more centered and aligned with is the power on or business is open, just really high level generic pieces of data um, around those. And this is a very scaled back approach um, that those surveys would then feed a particular dashboard so that you would have the opportunity to see and sort um, by different jurisdictions, damage assessment information that is available. I think my connectivity is waning as we continue. So I may pause here in a moment and uh, take some additional questions. Kimberly, any questions? Uh, yes, in fact, um, is the is meal the capacity, capacity by organization or total? 
So you should be able to filter it by organization when folks put that in, but showing it on the dashboard a moment ago, it was in total. So it was combined meal capacity across all organizations reporting on the dashboard. And that was the only question, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so there is no active data in here currently, because once again, we have not launched yet for the damage assessment, but this is where you would be able to see um, the partner layer of any partner damage assessment reported by our faith-based partners or corporate partners, anybody that has boots on the ground in the field that wanted to be able to capture very quick snapshot information through those quick and easy surveys on their mobile device to be able to report additional um, damage information. We also have a separate dashboard for the preliminary community assessment um, that would show you um, basically are the stores open or people out or not and is the power on or off and the total number of assessments. So just an important piece there and uh, to know that trying to capture as much information as possible and then of course be able to overlay it with authoritative sources of data um, is helpful to you. And I Managed to click out here, so give me just a second. All right, I'm trying to get to my last tab here. Okay, so this was one of the comparison maps that I had talked about where we want to be able to see everything in one place. So on the damage assessment page, this was the last application we developed. This has a number of filters. So if you're looking from a FEMA perspective or from a Civil Air Patrol perspective and you're looking for a particular event or disaster number, it has a number of filters that can be applied here. For the purpose of this, I'm not gonna use that filter and I'm gonna go see if we can go to Midland, Michigan where there was some recent flooding that occurred and see if we can get it to load some of the data um, here in this particular area. So we'll give it a moment. Um, so what you would see here, if this loads properly, um, is that you would see a number of rich layers of data that are listed. So you would see the FEMA individual assistance aggregated applications that show up as the squares. The darker the color, the higher the number of, um, of pieces of, or higher the number of registrations of people calling in. And then also having the overlay of the imagery from our partners at Civil Air Patrol. And in addition to the Red Cross detailed damage assessment layer would show up here. Um, where you would be able to see all of that information put together in one comparison map um, to once again understand where the gaps are and where there are imagery and photos that you could take a look at if you had questions about our particular area. I'm going to speed us along here so we wrap up and give you guys some time to be able to ask questions. Um, the last area we developed applications around was sheltering. Um, so making sure that once again we have the opportunity to be able to report an independent shelter. So there were four applications developed for sheltering. Um, one is reporting an independent shelter that may not be part of our national shelter system. So trying to create that comprehensive um, view and vantage point of what's taking place around the country. In the past we may have received an email at the American Red Cross from a faith-based partner that says, hey, we have a, did you know the First United Methodist Church is operating a shelter and they could use some cots or blankets as an example. So hopefully this allows us an opportunity for our partners to be able to report um, shelters that once again may not have access to the national shelter system. This data would then be vetted um, and updated and moved into the national shelter system as the information becomes available. As we had on the feeding applications, this application just allows you to be able to update the status. So if you needed to add a daily count to a particular um, location where a shelter was operating, you could update the daily count. If you wanted to update the operational status from you know, operating to closed, you would be able to do that here in the second column where it shows um, the population count and the shelter information here. And then finally, we had the dashboard, um, just like we have the feeding dashboard that was available. So you would see the open shelter summary dashboard where we have the national shelter system data on the right, and then you have the hub reported data on the left um, as information continues to get vetted and moved um, into a more comprehensive system for management and resourcing support. And finally, we included the opportunity to be able to register a building as a potential shelter. So we know that in particularly um, a lot of areas, communities of color, for instance, that we want to increase the number of available shelters in high risk, at risk communities as well, that we want to be able to make sure we have enough available shelters so people don't have to leave their community to shelter in another community. So this gives the opportunity on tools available to be able to register buildings as potential shelters and start that process um, for shelter facility surveys. 
And then uh, last two here, sharing data. So being able to share data in a way that people understand. So this is just kind of a high level of um, understanding how data is shared in the hub, whether it's through the surveys being completed, the uploads completed, um, or the um, automation that has been developed of being able to understand, you know, where disasters are occurring, where service delivery locations are, where you're feeding people, where damage is, where a shelter has opened, putting it all together in a comprehensive way to understand what's available and how you can help people um, in a more efficient way with less duplication and using our resources to the maximum opportunity. Exploring the data and being able to um, use some of the data sets to once again pull out of the hub and add to your own tools and resources as they're available. And then it walks you through how to upload point data or polygon data to the map as well from a geographical perspective. Last but not least, this is actually the sign on page. I didn't start with this because I wanted to end with it. Um, but as I mentioned, the hub is closed. So it does require an invitation. So there are two ways to access the hub in the future once we begin implementation. One is a push notification where you will be invited by email to join the hub um, and working with many of our existing national partner organizations on both the corporate and the non-government and government side as well. Um, but the second opportunity is at disasterpartners.org. There will be a visible sign up page where you can go in and be able to request an account. Um, so this is where we'll work once again with our partner organizations to make sure that they have a um, certain number of user accounts. For instance, if you, um, if you have a network at a national organization and local affiliates, or if you're just a smaller individual organization, you would have the ability to be able to sign up in the hub. And it'll ask you what you're using the hub for, contributing or using data, what your level of GIS experience is, and having an um, online username. Um, as well. And so that would be where you can reach us at partnerhub at redcross.org for any questions for the future. And uh, once again, my name is April Wood, april.wood at redcross.org if you need to reach out with any follow-up questions. And with that, I'm going to go um, yield the rest of the time back to you guys for any additional questions you may have as participants today. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope you're as excited as I am about using these tools heading into hurricane and wildfire season and being able to, uh, to once again, visualize data in a way that we've never had the opportunity to before, um, thanks to our public-private partnerships. April, I do have two questions for you. Um, one is, what is the best browser for uh, viewing the hub? Yeah, so Chrome and Firefox are the preferred browsers um, when using the hub. And uh, some of our internal Red Crossers need to clear their cache every once in a while, but our external partners have not had any issues with that. Um, it's just where we, we um, access it as internal Red Crossers. So. Addition, additionally, this is obviously about mass care information, but is it linked to the National Business Emergency Operations Center data, such as their power outage, retail status, et cetera? Um, so we pull in a number of open source feeds and tools that are available, and then there are another ongoing conversations around data that might not be publicly available, um, where we're looking to once again set up information sharing agreements or private agreements where we can license data to one another and really provide as much information as possible. So uh, we have many, many more conversations to have in the future. We do coordinate closely um, with the National Business EOC, um, and we do things like uh, use tools like Sabre, for instance, to be able to report um, from an EOC activity activity of open businesses that might be available or closed during a disaster and really looking to leverage any resources and data that we can pull in and share as well as share back any data that we may have um, that's informative for other people to use. From a partner perspective, what has been the biggest obstacle for partners to share their data? Yeah, so I talked about that technical infrastructure of being able to have these tech platforms or these databases that are a way that you can automate it. And so in many, many cases, we found that having um, manual exchange of data is, is where we are still stuck at in some cases of not having the, the automation and the technical sophistication yet or the financial resources to support technical sophistication to be able to automate a lot of this data that we know would be much more helpful to have. Um, so I would say the greatest barrier is still the technical infrastructure, particularly on the non-governmental side. On the government side, it's more restrictive on the policy side. So one of the greatest barriers is just information sharing practices and policies on the government side um, is one of the things that, that we've probably um, struggled with the most. And those are all the questions we have at this time. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for giving me an opportunity to share with you today and uh, look forward to connecting in the future. I've seen many of you over the years at this conference. It's a great conference and I hope you enjoy the rest of it. Have a great day.